This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you very much and thank you for the opportunity to talk about some of the traditional and uh, highly capable methods for imaging the aorta and also some uh, more new developments that uh, we're looking into. Uh, my lab does get some research support from Siemens Medical Systems and I'll be talking about the use of gadolinium and ultra-small paramagnetic ion oxide agents uh, which in application for looking at angiographic uh, imaging is an off-label use. So uh, I think the question uh, we are trying to look at with our imaging approaches is that uh, the realization that patients with vascular disease may present with very similar conditions of the luminal morphology, but that in many cases some of them will progress rapidly with devastating sequelae, whereas others with uh, apparently similar anatomies may remain stable over many years. And so is there something that imaging can provide us that might be able to uh, identify what are the drivers of more rapid progression and bad outcomes? So there are a broad variety of imaging modalities that are available. Uh, Catheter angiography has uh, got unrivaled uh, resolution and is extremely useful in the interventional setting where uh, treatment is being provided. Ultrasound, of course, having the huge advantage of being uh, completely non-invasive. But the two modalities that I'll spend most time talking about today are CT and MR. And uh, the reason that I'm going to focus on those is they're extremely well suited for uh, serial monitoring and having a look at the evolution over time because they are operator-independent techniques. They provide three-dimensional capabilities. We're able to visualize both the lumen and some components of the wall. Uh, and <clears throat> in uh, MR in particular, we'll, I'll show you some examples of its ability to uh, <clears throat> capture the velocity field. So uh, I think CT angiography has become an indispensable tool. It has an excellent and a rapid overview of the aortic anatomy. Uh, the acquisition speeds are so rapid that we can do the entire coverage of interest in a single breath hold. And uh, that capability provides us with excellent uh, depiction of the flow lumen and also some abilities to have a look at the wall of the aorta. Uh, rather than directly visualizing inflammatory responses, uh, by signal characteristics in CT angiography, we're more uh, able to have a look at the impact of the in inflammation on the uh, morphology, the thickness of the wall, and uh, get an indirect uh, assessment of inflammation from those types of measures. And uh, as we saw earlier, the importance in dissection of being able to visualize the anatomy of the intimal tear, the location of the, the tear, and uh, the entry and re-entry points, uh, CT angiography has uh, very powerful capabilities for that. So I show you a couple of examples, uh, some of them provided by my colleague Michael Hope from our radiologist, and we can see here uh, a, an example of a patient who presents with chest pain, and we see both the pre-contrast and the contrast acquisition. And if you look at the contrast acquisition, which is the first one that one typically looks at, we notice that uh, very clear de delineation of the lumen. But what we don't see, but we don't appreciate, which if you look at the pre-contrast image, is that there is some indication of hemorrhage, uh, 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 an increased uh, intensity in the wall uh, in the study. And in fact, this patient returned two months later. Uh, so we're looking at this location and he has now developed a dissection uh, at that uh, location 
uh, where, where we had uh, previously seen the hemorrhage into the wall. When we look at the anatomy, of course, it's uh, critical to differentiate the true lumen from the false lumen. The left image, we see uh, the, uh, the interval tear, and uh, clearly we can have a look at that uh, generally the true lumen will uh, have a convexity bulging out into the false lumen. And uh, there's additional information as we run down the aorta collecting the data, uh, we're going through different cardiac phases, and in some cases we'll capture the aorta in uh, systole, and we see the size of the uh, true lumen in systole, and then in diastole it uh, collapses somewhat in the, uh, the situation. Uh, in addition to that, we also have the passage of the contrast material, which will first come in in the uh, first pass going through the true lumen and later into the false lumen. So we can see here uh, the differential enhancement of the true lumen and the false lumen uh, with first pass. But uh, all things being equal, once we have this data, we can see that CT again shows us because of its excellent resolution, its robust imaging capabilities in the presence of uh, disturbed flow and other uh, uh, situations that we are able to identify the, uh, the entry tear here and uh, see the retrograde dissection up the aorta in this uh, individual. And finally, again, here in the aorta uh, showing that uh, Depending on the phase of the acquisition, the uh, true lumen will enhance early, and then later on, uh, after the contrast has passed through, we'll see it hanging up in the false lumen. So again, additional information from that dynamic study. There are some concerns with CT angiography, obviously. There uh, requires uses of iodinated contrast agents. In surveillance imaging, we uh, want to be careful that we don't uh, subject our patients to multiple radiation sessions. Although we do see some soft tissue information, I will show you that compared to MR imaging, that soft tissue information is very limited. And there is no information on flow dynamics. So let's turn to MR imaging in application to the aortic wall. The strength of MR is its unrivaled ability to alter imaging parameters to bring out the different components of the disease. It has uh, excellent flow visualization, as I hope I'll be able to show you. No radiation associated with it. Again, 3D acquisitions. And also uh, some early indications that we can have a look at uh, some inflammatory components in the vessel wall. Similar to CT, MR can also uh, identify the different features of the aortic dissection. Here's an example. Uh, on the left is the MR angiogram, a 2D slice showing a bright enhancement of the true lumen, whereas the slow flow in the false lumen is uh, low intensity. We have CINE acquisitions where we can gate to the cardiac cycle and see the intimal flap moving back and forth through the cycle. And then finally, a so-called black blood technique where the intensity of the blood is suppressed for fast-flowing blood, so in the true lumen, but for slow-flowing blood, not suppressed as much. And again, a good ability to differentiate those two uh, channels. For looking at inflammation, we know that uh, if we use uh, appropriate preparation, and by this I mean fat saturation to eliminate all the uh, enhancing uh, the bright signal from fat, uh, black blood to again suppress the flow in the lumen, and have a look after the delivery of gadolinium, uh, we can see that uh, there's very clear enhancement of the wall in this patient with uh, inflammation of the aorta. Uh, so let's have a look at some other features of MR imaging. First of all, take a look at imaging the lumen. We generally do this with a volume acquisition in a, the coronal plane. And in order to get uh, the optimal imaging, the key 
feature is to time the arrival of the bolus of contrast with the acquisition window. And uh, the acquisition parameters are sort of a 15 second acquisition is sufficient. We'll deliver an agent such as gadolinium DTPA and then we get this uh, clear delineation of the anatomy. But obviously, the flow channel, the lumen, is not where the disease resides. The disease resides in the vessel wall. And so looking at the lumen is an uh, indirect indication of what we're really interested in. So let me discuss in the remaining minutes some uh, investigations that we're doing into abdominal aortic aneurysms. As you know, the fusiform aneurysms that often present with large volumes of intraluminal thrombus. And we would like a technique that gives us high contrast between the wall and the lumen. And again, we'll use this technique that suppresses blood signal, or, uh, uh, so-called black blood MR. The typical resolution that we strive for is 1.3 millimeters isotropic, 1.3 millimeters in X, Y, and Z. And uh, again, the drawback of MR is it's a very slow technique. To acquire this data requires of the order of seven minutes. Now, obviously, this is much too long for a breath hold. And so what we do is we use MR in a mode where we use the imaging to actually monitor the patient's breathing during the acquisition of data. If the breathing causes the anatomy to move by more than one or two millimeters, that data is rejected and reacquired. So the MR has this intrinsic ability to acquire the good data and reject the bad data. Uh, some of the challenges are that uh, the flow, we try to suppress flow, but if it's slow and recirculating, it can cause an artifact. And breathing motion uh, would generate artifacts, but as I say, we can account for that. So this is sort of the appearance that we might get with these types of technique. On the top is a, uh, from a normal volunteer, the two arrows indicate the renal arteries, but we are suppressing the flow from the, uh, in the lumen. And we can also see some indication here in the iliacs of the vessel wall as a bright structure relative to the lumen. In a patient with disease of the, uh, with AAA and large amounts of uh, intraluminal thrombus, in the lower set of images over here, we can see the patent lumen, yes, uh, the black region, and clearly the depiction of very different components in the wall. And why is that? We know that uh, methemoglobin, fresh blood, has a reduced T1 relaxation time and appears hyperintense. And interestingly, that's generally on the outer wall of the lumen, not on the juxtaluminal, uh, on the outer wall of the, the, the disease, not on the juxtaluminal side. And it's probably the vasa viscorum <coughs> leaking into the outer wall. Compare this to a CT angiogram in the same patient at the same levels. Clearly a very good correlation of the lumen, but if you look in the, the wall, CT is iso-intense. It is not sensitive to these differences in the different components uh, that are present there, and so uh, indicating the strength of MR in this cap uh, application. So uh, again, 1.3 uh, millimeter cubic uh, resolution. And uh, let's take a look at uh, a, a new agent that's uh, be been out on the market for a, a year or so, a couple of years now. Actually, it's, it's more than that. Uh, this is a, a therapeutic ferromoxetol, which is used for iron deficient anemia and is FDA approved in that application. Turns out that ferromoxetol has very powerful MR contrast properties. In dilution, it provides an enhancement and so it can be used for an angiographic effect. But if it gets concentrated when it's scavenged by macrophage, sequestered in the macrophage, it becomes a, a very uh, strong su suppressor of MR signal. So there is a potential that, uh, first of all, here the first pass MRA using ferromoxetol. The black blood imaging at baseline, we then bring the patient, the 
back five days later, and at five days following the delivery of furamoxetol, we see these regions within the wall, within the thrombus, that are now uh, low intensity regions where the furamoxetol has been scavenged by the macrophage and is uh, being sequestered in those locations. So I'll show you another example of a patient uh, with a very rapidly growing iliac artery aneurysm. Again, we did this for amoxetol administration and the patient also had an FDG PET. So here's the MRA at uh, the rapidly growing iliac aneurysm. We can see at baseline the CT angiogram. Two years later, uh, this aneurysmal wall has grown substantially. And if we have a look at the pre furamoxetol imaging of the tissue, and then the post furamoxetol we see clear indication that this is uh, a region where there's uh, inflammatory cells that are scavenging the macrophage. If we look at the PET, uh, again, a very good uh, delineation that that region was uh, very strongly metabolically active. Uh, I'm going to rapidly go through some techniques that we have for 4D flow measurement. I apologize, I've reached the end of my time, but uh, we can use MR to get this overview of the velocity fields and uh, just show you here a couple of examples. Here a patient with a, uh, not the largest aneur uh, aneurysm we see, but we can see capturing the flow vectors going through this aneurysm through the cardiac cycle. Uh, we see the jet, the recirculation. Uh, and then another patient with a more interesting anatomy, and I just find this fascinating, the uh, multilobular aneurysm, but we can see this rotor of flow circulating around in the uh, aneurysm over here and the uh, flow streaming around the outside of the, that region. So in summary, 4D flow can be um, used. We think it'll have a good uh, ability to help us predict thrombus layering uh, indicate the presence of disordered or turbulent flow and help us differentiate between the true and false lumen. Uh, and from these velocity measurements, we can get a secondary descriptors such as wall shear stress and other indicators which we think are important in uh, the de definition of what are the drivers of the rapid progression of vascular disease. Thank you very much for your attention.